Good evening, friends. Welcome to this special edition of the ACNS webinars. As you all might be aware that the month of November is the birth month of our president, Prof. Yuko Kato. We have decided to celebrate this whole month in a very special way. Partnering with the leading neurosurgery publishing group, Theme Publishers, we have decided to give away free subscription of the Medwin Neurosurgery which is a large repository of neurosurgical literature in the form of e-books, e-journals, and online videos and case discussion. I hope all the attendees of this webinar will have a great time enjoying the extended subscription for the next 15 days. Coming back to our webinars for this month of special webinars, we have decided to have two speakers per session who will give their insightful lectures in their concerned subspeciality. The first speaker for today is a person who has excelled in pediatric neurosurgery. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to introduce you to the past president of the International Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery, the current editor of the prestigious journal, Child's Nervous System, Professor Concesio Di Rocco. Professor Di Rocco is the director of the pediatric neurosurgery at the International Neuroscience Institute, Hanover, Germany. In his vast clinical experience, he has operated more than 12,000 cases of pediatric brain tumors and spinal cord tumors, and also a similar number of congenital anomalies. He also presently serves as the co-chairman of the Education Committee of WFNS. He has been instrumental in steering educational policies for young neurosurgeons while, the, while decorating several important positions in the past, like being the president of the European Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery, vice president of the European Association of Neurosurgical Society, Chairman of the Pediatric Committee of the WFNS and Director of the Department of Pediatrics and Pediatric Neuroscience at the Catholic University Medical School, Rome. In this year, Professor Di Rocco, together with Professor D. Pang and Professor James Rutka, has edited one of the most valuable book titled The Textbook of Pediatric Neurosurgery, published by Springer, which conveys the most updated knowledge in pediatric neurosurgery. We are so fortunate today to have him as a speaker in our webinars. Today, Professor D. Rocco is going to talk about Chiari 1 malformation. The second speaker for today is Professor Zai Rong, who is the Associate Professor from the Department of Neurosurgery, Hua Shan Hospital, Fudan University, Shanghai, China. Having done his postdoctoral from Stanford, he currently specializes in, in the surgical treatment on various types of spinal cord neoplasms, neurospine disease, craniovertebral junction malformations, and other degenerative spinal diseases. Professor Rong also focuses on basic research of spinal cord and spine disease. We are indeed glad to have him as a second speaker for today who will talk about anterior approach to cervical spine, how I use it. To chair this session of Professor D. Rocco and Professor Zirong, we are blessed with the presence of Professor Nobuhito Morota, who is the Clinical Associate Professor and Director of Division of Pediatric Neurosurgery, Kitasato University School of Medicine, Sagamihara, Japan. Professor Morota is a prominent member of the Japanese Society of Neurosurgery and is a clinical visiting professor in various acclaimed institutes across Japan. He is on the editorial board of the ISPN as well as the GSPN. He is an executive member of the Japanese Society of Spina Bifida, Asia Australia Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery and Japanese Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery. He has published several manuscripts in various acclaimed neurosurgery journals. We are so blessed to have him today for chairing this special edition of ACNS webinars. On behalf of the Education Committee and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I hereby welcome both the speakers today, Professor Kansasio Dirok and Professor Zirong, as well as the Chair, Professor Nobuhito Morata, to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Bun Seng from Malaysia is my co-host for today. With that introduction, may I please hand over the platform to Professor Morata. So the, the first lecture was by Professor Dirok, and uh, he's a very famous uh, world-leading pediatric niche surgeon for more than 30 years here. <laughs> And he has recently published a textbook of pediatric neurosurgery from Springer. Uh, the co-editor was uh, Professor Pan and Ruska. And maybe you all of us will enjoy the new textbook of pediatric neurosurgery. And his talk today is about care malformation type one. And the care malformation type one is so mysterious. And uh, what do we think we do know something about Chiari malformation, but there's so many uh, lack of information about its natural history or the surgical indication or the, even the surgical procedure. Every surgeon has his own surgical procedure and there's no global standard for which procedure is the best fit for this 
key element formation something like that. And uh, he's going to talk about the depth and uh, tell us what's the problem of key formation nowadays in this 21st century. So Professor Diroka, <laughs> please start your lecture. <laughs> okay, thank you. So happy birthday to Yoko and uh, thanks for the invitation. And the thanks to Nobu for the presentation and uh, to introduce the concept of uh, a mysterious disease, which is true because actually we are publishing a lot of uh, papers and these papers are increasing every year, but still, as he said, we don't have a real standard approach and uh, or a standard understanding of this uh, malformation. So my talk is uh, aimed at stopping to call carry type one a malformation because actually it is not a malformation. Even in the internet, if you go to see the definition, you find it's a congenital and a brain anomaly. And you will know all of what is this uh, caudal descent of the cerebellar tonsils in the upper cervical canal. But they had a congenital anomaly, which is a little better than malformation. But what is really an anomaly is that this still mysterious conditions is the subject of an increasing number of publications. You can see how it's uh, in an exponential uh, increase, like the COVID uh, infection. It's, uh, so there are so many papers that are increasing and increasing. So but we, we try to see the real incidence, at least I'm speaking about pediatric, of the patients with uh, this congenital anomaly, you can see this very large study that was done with a large population that was screened. And out of these thousands of children, only 51 cases were identified with this caudal position of the tonsils to justify the congenital anomaly. And only one out of six of these children had an associate uh, syringomyelia. Why I don't, I don't like to use the term malformation? Because malformations has a, a term, a, a practical uh, meaning, practical implications. Means uh, a maldevelopmental process. So the family can start why our child has this uh, malformation. It's our fault. It's a disease that is inherited by us. And so the family starts to be very concerned and very anxious. So it becomes ready to everything. And even to inappropriate surgical indication, because if you, you feel to have, you feel to have a malformation, you are ready to have the malformation correct, especially if they say it's a dangerous malformation. But most of these children are asymptomatic, are screened for all the condition, the ache, uh, the injury. So this was only asymptomatic. This one had a chronic mild ache. And this had, had injury in case he, that the chiari was quite consistent, but not really it's an inc incidental discovery. This also had the car discovered after an head injury. But then you can see that he has an initial syngomyelia and this kind of herniation. And the problem is because he's a young football player, promising one, so he wants to continue to play. So this is a, this incidental recognitions of a carry one has led to an increasing difficulties for the neurosurgeon to establish a surgical indication in patients that have no symptoms or very mild clinical signals. 
So they are asked what we have to do and how to have we to do. And this is not easy to, to answer. Half of the children with uh, asymptomatic uh, carry one uh, at diagnosis have uh, this kind of uh, extended herniation without any problems, and they represent half of the case. So in this half, we have to say what to do, and it's not easy to decide, especially because there is no a clinical picture of a car. We have a lot of uh, uh, anomalies, functional anomalies that have been associated to Chiari, but we don't know which are really important. You can see we have anomalies uh, very, very uh, different, seizures, sleep disorders, orthostatic intolerance and syncope. So these symptoms really are difficult to be interpreted and utilized even in symptomatic patients for the surgical indication. The, the problem starts when we have uh, symptoms that are a little more consistent and a few children have. And even more dangerous is the presence, the sudden death. The sudden death has been described in an anecdotal case, I think no more than three or four cases in the history, but this is an argument that is used by the neurosurgeon that wants to operate. They tell the family, your child they can die abruptly, and so the family is uh, uh, very frightened and they go goes to the operation. And they actually, in the world, we have institutes that are devoted only to carry one. We have in Europe, we have in America, and we have probably in Asia. And uh, I think that uh, the great, great majority of the children operated there actually don't need any surgical treatment. But this problem exists, the abrupt deterioration. See this, uh, in our, this is our case, two years old, arrived to in intensive care department for progressive tetraparesis, followed a mild trauma. It was with the grandmother in the tube to have a bath and they hit the back uh, of the head. They started re after some hours to have a problem with respiration and they when they arrived to in our university, the diagnosis was some kind of a viral disease that had involved the upper spinal cord and the brain stem. But obviously we noticed this carry and we decided to try to make a posterior fossa expansion. And we did, and this the child recovered completely. So even if it is an ex exception, we have to consider that this uh, possibility exists. So some, some time is a malformation and needs the operation. But in most of the cases, we have to ask ourselves if it is really uh, something that exists or we are just watching only this without considering all the context. And what we have uh, to decide for carry? We have just this five millimeters below this line. And this is really some things that no one knows why we're selected five, not seven, not three. And also what really does mean if we do not consider what is around? We can have uh, this uh, five millimeters in such a variety of uh, clinical conditions that let us to think that this is uh, just an AP phenomenon. It's uh, not the problem. It's not the five, five millimeters counter herniation of the tonsils, the problem of a carry one. Indeed, you can find a lot of patients that don't have any things. This, uh, a lady operated for this small glioma, 
and this we did not treat, no, did not change. This seems very uh, severe, rapid task, and then this, but this uh, uh, kind of syringomelia fade away spontaneously and did not come back. We can have in the carry in cranial synostosis, even in the in the symbol of one, like a sagittal synostosis. We can have uh, in a uh, unicorolla synostosis, we can uh, have uh, a carry in exotic disease, like this Goram syndrome in which the bone is disappearing, but you can see how extended is the cranial herniation. In this syndrome, you can have in the PTEN syndrome, that is the syndrome that induce tumors, and you can see here that we can have a Chiari malformation. Obviously, we can have a herniation of a, in the tonsils in case of a supratentorial acute hydrocephalus. That was the original, Ill, the original cause that was uh, interpreted by Chiari. So we, it's uh, hard to say five millimeters of herniation is the problem if we don't consider the malformative context that is around this herniation because the problem is the malformative context, which give it uh, origin to different uh, kind of the chiari. And so we cannot apply the same operation or the same indication to all the ty chiari types that uh, can have a so different cause. So we have to take different interpretation and different indication. So to, going back to malformation, I don't know what's the first that they coined the term malformation. Certainly was not Chiari. At the time of Chiari, you can see this uh, atlas for pregnant women that uh, I found. You can see that there is a Chiari malformation in the atlas. No one is uh, paying attention to this. So actually Chiari uh, take into account the old interpretation of Morgagne that said that they found a large dilation of the ventricle and this descent of the tonsils. So even Chiari, when he described this Chiari one in this way that you all know, he was describing this girl, this young lady that died tortified fever, she had a, a unknown hydrocephalus, and uh, he said that this probably was the cause of uh, the herniation. Uh, and after we can have ventricular dilation and associate Chiari malformation. But this uh, hypothesis, that is uh, the mechanical hypothesis from, of a pressure from above, is supported by the regression of a Chiari when we treat the hydrocephalus, either with a shunt or endoscopy, but it's not supported, but all the cases that have Chiari without ventricular dilation, so without hydrocephalus. So it's not explaining the problem. You know that at the beginning we talk about Chiari, Arnold Chiari malformation. Arnold after described the case of a spinal bifida probably, and he reported this, uh, uh, some downward descent of the lower parts of the cerebellum and the fourth ventricle. You know, nowadays this is the Chiari type two malformation, <coughs> which is uh, associated to spinal bifida. And actually, he was not able to explain the deformity that he had reported. And the students that want to make career to be promoted, these two people put the name of Arnold together with Chiari and coined this definition that is not correct and should be forgot. 
The other hypothesis is uh, the descent from attraction from below, because in some syndrome, like uh, for example, Curarino Cura syndrome, with this kind of over malformation at the level of the sacrum and the coccyx, you can have an associate chiari. And so the hypothesis was that there was a traction from below is playing the chiari. But also, this hypothesis was never demonstrated. When you have a thick film, you don't have a chiari. They tried to fix the conus in the animals in experiments, and they were not able to induce the herniation of the cerebellum. And even more important, we have hundreds and hundreds of the patients with lipomyelomeningocele that don't have any kind of a, uh, of a chiari. We can have chiari only in this malformative context. So another problem that induce chiari is uh, the loss of the fluid in the prenatal life, like uh, happens in uh, myelomeningocele. You know that the most uh, obvious result of uh, intrauterine repair of the myelomeningocele uh, is the uh, regression of a chiari one. And uh, you can have also another situation in which you remove fluid, for example, repeated uh, lumbar punctures or the use of the lumbar peritoneal cerebrospinal fluid shunts that remove fluid from the spine and create a pressure gradient that push the supratentorial and the intratentorial structure down and can create a chiari. And an example it can be also trauma that induce neural laceration a chronic loss of fluid. This is a, one case of operator in ANOVA. You can see a severe uh, trauma in, in the traffic accident. This is a damage of the spinal cord and the laceration of the dura. And after a few days, the fluid herniated and they went with like a sac that make the diagnosis. And they tried to repair without a success. And but finally, when we could stop this fluid go out, at the time there was this chiari, after the stop of the fistula, the chiari went away. So again, not a congenital malformation, but some changes in the equilibrium of the brain, of the skull, spina and their content. Even more surprising is the spontaneous regression of a chiari malformation that has been reported in adults, but can be observed also in children. There are several reports that speak about a chiari that regress spontaneously. So also this regression, spontaneous regressions, is against a malformation. The malformation cannot regress spontaneously. But we can have chiari in several conditions. If you have a, a subarachnoid cyst, and if you put a shunt in this arachnoid cyst, what do you have in time? You have this thickening, progressive thickening of the skull because of the chronic removal of the, the, the fluid by the shunt the inner skull becomes small, and then the brain that before was, at the beginning, was completely uh, in equilibrium with the container, started to, be, to go down while the container became thicker. And the only way to escape from the brain that is in a container that becomes too small is the carry one, see, going down. In this case, we have not to operate the posterior fossa because we will increase the caudal dis displacement of the brain and the cerebellum, but actually we have to enlarge the skull. So opening on the skull and not on the posterior fossa. So 
probably in several cases, the carry malformation, so called, is really something that is changing inside the brain to accommodate a, a, some, for example, skull that is too small, like canosinostosis or in the chronic shunt of the patients, to accommodate changes in pressure, for example, deletion, subatentorial, high pressure, and low uh, spinal pressures, or a shunt in the lumbar column that create uh, some pressure gradient. So the most case, the chiari is a, a functional state that can even regress after spontaneously or after the correct uh, uh, correction. So the other question, when we see an incidental chiari without symptoms, we have to ask if it is a stable or is just the beginning of the progressive conditions. We started several years ago, now we have more than 200 cases followed without doing anything. And in asymptomatic or very, with very mild symptoms, children that were not operated and followed in the great, great majority of the cases, the condition was stable. We had only two cases that uh, uh, progressed, but they were associated with uh, hydrocephalus. And this has been observed in the following years by large series of patients. You yeah, have this uh, Japanese at the time, he had even syringomyelia and uh, follow for 10 years, and the syringomyelia did not progress, neither the care. You, you can have example, several example, uh, follow three years, even a large carry that they did not progress. Obviously, if, if the context is a pathological, like in this uh, clipper file, then you can have a, a progression. So it's not a progression of the carry, it's a progression of the malformative syndrome in which we found in this condition. We can have also another syndrome, like a Costello syndrome, in which the posterior fossa is a normal to begin, but then progressively it becomes smaller because the cerebellum grow too much. The cerebellum grow after birth, so we, it's apparently progressive, but it's not really the chiari, but it's a, the cerebellum. See, for example, in this child with a cruzone, when he did after birth the exam, he had no chiari, just the cerebellar tonsils that were at the border of the forana. And only a few weeks after, you have the chiari that apparently progress. So it's not, again, the tonsils that go down the carry that the progress, but if it is the skull, the craniosynostosis, that rapidly induce a disproportion between the content, the cerebellum, of a, and the size of the posterior fossa. We can see how change the, the, the shape of the posterior fossa to accommodate the brain. But even what is more convincing to me is that we don't have just a caudal descent. What we have also is a cranial ascent of the cerebellum. So we have these two movements that demonstrate that this, the problem is not the cerebellum going down. The problem is that the posterior force become progress, progressively too small to accommodate the growing cerebellum. So I reduced the, 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 the peri, uh, pericerebral space and the upper worms go up and the lower worms go down looking for space. They just need space. And if you don't do anything, you can see how progressively this uh, posterior force becomes smaller and the carry is smaller. 
if you operate the carry either from in front or from a back in this situation, the child will die, simply die. And like in this case, you have to work on the scar. So we have a lot of uh, other arguments like uh, that in a part of the children, the posterior fossa is uh, smaller than normal. We have a lot of uh, papers that uh, there are some other parameters that change. But essentially, this is the problem. A too small space in the posterior fossa. Now, uh, every patient is the same. But small posterior fossa does not mean just herniation. It means also circulation problems, crowding of vessels. It means also respiratory problems. So the apnea, all these kind of things that are associated to Chiari are really associated to a posterior fossa too small to accommodate the neural structures. So we have a problem of a space, problem of a brain circulation. See what this means. You can see this uh, cerebellum that fills completely the posterior fossa, even herniates, and moves very, very, very small pul pulsation. We make the coagulation of the tonsils, and uh, you can see we superior coagulation. And then we reduce this, watch the tonsils, the cerebellum, and when we succeed in making the tonsils smaller and the fluid circulating better, what happened? The cerebellum starts to pulsate probably in a normal way. So you can see how tight was the cerebellum before and how it's relaxed after the operation. So in most cases, the carry one is related to the cre creation of a cranial cerebral disproportion. So it's uh, the result of an abnormal state. This cyst, for example, was shunned. And again, the cyst progressively became smaller, the skull became thicker, the inner, the posterior uh, skull became too small, and then we have the chiari that appears. That appears, become symptomatic and become severe. At this point, you should not go there. You have to enlarge the skull. And you can see the progression, like I said before, up and down herniation of the cerebellum. And this is the moment in which we have to operate. And what we did was to enlarge the skull and to in this way, we could treat the so-called malformation, carry malformation. So this is uh, all the things that you can have, uh, especially in shunted children, low intracranial pressure, because the fluid is going to remove the by the shunt. So the, the sinus become larger, the muscle system become very, uh, very small, the posterior cranial fossa become small, start the chiari, and then we have all this, the problem of the small posterior fossa and all this symptomatology. But the chiari is not a malformation. It's just a part of all this uh, symptomatology. And all these symptoms that derive from the different changes need the specific operation. The calvary expansion is uh, the last one, and obviously is uh, the most uh, occurring, the most severe so, situation. So we have uh, to intercept the evolution of the Chiari, try to understand, and I think that uh, no other example in medicine was called for so long a time in a wrong way, malformation. So I think that is calling malformation changes our mind and the mind of the family, favors 
a lot of uh, useless operations. And uh, just to conclude, when we have an acute epidural hematoma, we have uh, this kind of herniation, but temporal herniation, but will never we call temporal malformation. So why to call malformation the herniation of the Thank you very much. This is a book that for making some published. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Diroka. Uh, so you say the care malformation type one should be called the care type one state, right? <laughs> and we should add the cause. And uh, so if we say carry state or carry one, let's say, not a malformation. With craniosynostosis, we know that we have to treat the craniosynostosis. If we say carry with hydrocephalus, drain hydrocephalus, we know that we have to see the hydrocephalus. If we say carry with a bone metabolic disease, we know that we should see the scalp. But if we have 100 cases of a carry without explaining the etiology, mm -hmm. I see. And then say, so, oh, some did well, other did badly. This information is completely useless because we don't know really what they operate. They operate yeah. for millimeters millimeters of a down yeah. displacement of the cerebellum, but we don't know anymore. So if you say carry malformation, people think that the malformation should be repaired, right? So, <laughs> so better, you, you call that, it carry state. So it's a state. So if it's symptomatic, then you can consider exactly. surgery of something. Exactly. Yeah, that makes that, that uh, interpret, interpretation sense. Yeah. Any, any question from the- yeah, I think we'll yeah. open the topic for discussion. I'll start with, with myself, Professor Diroko. It was a great lecture. Thank you very much for you. Uh, such insightful lecture. May I please ask you, what is your procedure cho of choice? Is it for, PFD or PFD with duroplasty. So what, I, what I do, I try to talk with the family, okay? That's, they understand the problem. If it is incidental uh, discovery, and I say to them, please wait, follow the child for other MR, and we see if we have to operate. Then let's say the children really start to have symptoms. And then what we do, we remove just uh, the squama of the occipital bone, just operation on the bone. And in the majority of the cases, the symptoms disappear. But then we have a few cases which continue to deteriorate. And then comes your problem. We have to open the dura. In this case, we prefer to make an enlarging duroplasty. That can be done with all the materials, and uh, this is not one better than other. If it does not work, we coagulate the tonsils. I saw in one of your videos you are coagulating the tonsil resection. Yeah. So it yeah, is. Uh, so I, very, yeah, I saw it. You coagulating on the medial side. However, it is recommended that you start coagulating on the lateral side because a postoperative scarring on the medial side may hinder further obstruction. Have you noticed in your case series anything but such like this? That? We do every time a superficial coagulation. We don't touch the surface of the tonsil. We empty the tonsil from inside. So the scar we did not have a significant scar problem. Here's my dear friend Luke. Hello, Prof. Thanks for a nice presentation. Uh, uh, my question for incidental uh, findings of uh, carry type 1, uh, those without uh, shingle myelia formation, either in adult or pediatric, uh, how extensive uh, neuro, neuro imaging that you're going to perform for, from cranial to spinal uh, to find out the uh, uh, carry from uh, type 1 is due to a sequelae of some other pathology? And how do you follow up by clinical and also uh, radiological? And if you need surgery, do you believe in uh, posterior fossa reconstruction? So then when we see the child for the first time, we do an MR of uh, all the spina, 
and the a clinical examination with a pediatrician to rule out other problem. We can have, a, for example, now it's easily found some problem of the bone and some kind of a metabolic disease. And this result in a progressive thickening of the skull. And then this carry can be the beginning of some more serious problem, a progressive of the carry. So rule out this situation. We tried at the beginning to have also other studies, for example, evoke the potential, hearing, examinations, a lot of these things. But at the end, they were not very useful. So we practically stopped. We asked for an MR six months after, then one year for the first three or four years. But it's important to educate the, the family because you will find every time another surgeon that will tell the family, oh, you're crazy. If you don't operate, your child can die abruptly. And this make a very rich, some uh, private clinic in the States and uh, in Spain, in Europe. Thank because you. the operation is easy if yeah. you remove it. So you don't know what is, you don't know what to do. The operation is easy, you can gain money, why not? This is uh, the real problem. Thank you, Professor. I think is, uh, there is one question popped up in the chat box, which you have already answered that, how frequent would you image an asymptomatic chiari? It is from Amir Sohail who has asked. I told you, uh, six months after the first detections, and then once a year for three or four years. May I have um, one question? Yeah, sure, why not? Yeah. <laughs> you know okay. everything now. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you think about the associated scoliosis, uh, like, uh, Cared malformation and uh, some bald uh, seedings, so, and the patient has scoliosis. How do you think about how do you approach the patient? This, this is a real problem because uh, scoliosis is the one that uh, does not improve very much, even if you make a correction of the care. Obviously, if it is in syringomyelia, scoliosis is a child. That, symptomatic, then we have to operate, we have to do mm -hmm. some things. But we don't promise an improvement to the family because like in the title record, scoliosis is the less responding. The syringomyelia can improve, but take some time, one or two years to disappear. Also this, we should tell to the family. That auto operation syringomyelia can remain almost similar and can take months before to see the result. But right. the, the yeah, scoliosis tended to stay. Okay. I don't know your experience. Yes, I agree with you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, one more question. The, yeah, sure. you know, the, nowadays, children often come to neurosurgery for comparing headache, just headache. Yeah. And sometimes you find the cared malformation, right? <laughs> How do you think then about this? I will uh, ask your, I will, I will, this is very difficult yeah, this, situation, this, this, you know. Yes. And the American neurosurgeon, pediatric neurosurgeon, often operates for the exactly. children with headache. I never do it only for headache. If there's some other sign or okay. symptom, then I operate. I, I agree. Com yes, I agree completely with you. First, because uh, sixty percent of headache in children depends from other reason and they are not dangerous. So, and the, this headache can be followed with MR. Never happened that I had an abrupt deterioration, mm -hmm. never. We had abrupt deterioration in the literature only after some big trauma, but only three of, or four case in the history, no so many, while Chiari are a hundred, hundred and the other. So I, will, I tell the family that is not a sign, the headache. So we wait for sign that is the appearance of syringomyelia, but not for headache. And as you said, Americans and some other operate for this, with these simple uh, symptoms. That's very subjective, especially when the family is concerned, the child, knows that the family is concerned. So every time they wanted to 
I have the attention of the parents. Uh-huh. They say, oh, I have a headache. So yeah. <laughs> it's a vicious cycle. Yeah. And I can complete it. Thank you very much. I wish we could take many questions, I admit, but due to lack of time, we'll pass on to, to our next lecture. Professor Zairong, may we please invite, may I please invite you to start your webinar? So we move on to that, uh, Professor Rongs. Good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to have this opportunity to talk about the anterior approach to the surgical spine. I believe most neurosurgeons and uh, hospital surgeons are very familiar with this approach. So today I have uh, hope to provide some tips and experience on it and to help improve patient's care. So um, anterior approach uh, is direct and elegant method deal with the pathologists come from the anterior cervical column. When we talk about the anterior approach, we, uh, usually we can divide it into three approaches that is transoral and anterolateral approach and the speed maneuvering approach. And today we just focus on anterolateral approach, which is widely used. And uh, just to give a brief uh, introduction on transoral approach. And due to the limited time, we will not talk about speed maneuvering approach, which is uh, especially for upper thoracic surgery. And um, for transoral approach, um, Usually the patient is in a supine position with the neck hypertension. And sometimes we just, uh, uh, with the assistant of the cranial traction. And uh, then we just use a special retractor to compress down the turn and elevate the soft palate. Then we can easily expose the C0 to C3. And sometimes we also can overhand the uvula. Or sometimes we just cut off the soft at the hard palate and with the nasopathic assistance, we can expand the exposure. And we need to pay attention when the patient is uh, combined with atlantoxial dislocation and or combined with a basal origination. Usually the odontoid is in a high level. And so at this situation, the transoral approach could not reach the odontoid. We need to use transnasal approach, usually assisted by uh, endoscope. Um, instead. So after oral tracheal intubation, we just uh, cut the mucus fissure the, along the median of the prevertebral muscles. Usually it's a thing and a vascular. And then we can expose the anterior arc of C1 and the odontoid for next odontoid that we tumor resection, the C1 to joint adhesion release. And the landmark is the anterior tubercle of the C1. And above it, is pectoral membrane, and below it is um, uh, anterior longitudinal movement. And the bilateral side is the key muscle for anterior approach that is longest calling muscle. And the safety margin from the middle line at the anterior arc of C1 is 15 millimeter, and the, the form of magma is 11 millimeter. For excess lower body is 40 millimeter, do not be on this width. And, uh, when we uh, remove the odontoid, just use a kerosene bronger uh, to carefully remove the cortex shell. And uh, we, we should try to protect the transverse ligament behind the dance, which is very helpful to the uh, stability of C1 to joint. So after operation, we need to leave the nasal gastric tube for five to seven days. And we should use some antibiotics uh, to prevent the infection. We need to check the wound to avoid the potential dehiscence, which pharyngeal abscess and the CSF leakage. So um, this is a patient that is under 55 years old. We can see the um, MR, uh, it, there is a mass compressed uh, obligator and the seat substantial the mass destroy the odontoid and uh, also some part of the uh, anterior arc of the C1. So we use a uh, transoral approach to resect the mass and then during approaching, we just uh, expose the anterior arc of the C1 and the odontoid and we can uh, expose the mass and we totally re- remove the mass and we can see the dual is intact. And for the um, stability concern, we just give posterior fixation and the post-operative pathology should inflammatory granuloma. And for uh, the anterolateral approach um, designed by Smith Robinson is widely used till now. It can access C3 to T1 easily. 
And so we call the work cross of anterior approach to the cervix spine. It can be used for cervix spondylosis, cervix tumor, um, ossification of a posterior longitudinal ligament and the cervical deformity. And the, the most frequent cervical procedure is ACDF, that means anterior cervical disectomy and fusion. And uh, on the other hand, we should know the common complications such as the solar arthrosis and the adjacent segment degeneration. And uh, for ACD without uh, fusion, it's still controversial. And some people think, uh, think that uh, it can keep some activity of cervix spine, but it has a high incidence of a neck pain and the kyphosis after the operation. And other procedure contains ACCF, the anterior cervical compactment and fusion. And also um, some, some, operation, uh, some operations without fusion, such as cervical disc arthroplasty and the total disc replacement. And then um, for history in 1955, is for, uh, this approach is first described by Robinson and Smith and modified by South Wakeman and Robinson to access C3 down to T1. And, uh, and uh, it, uh, uh, this, this approach is through the space internal side of the standard colloidal mastoid muscle and the lateral side of the prevertebral muscles and just slow this space and uh, can easily get the uh, anterior part of the cervix spine. And in, 19, uh, in 1958, the Cardo report is the first AC, uh, ACDF. We can see the patient got a strong fusion after surgery. And we also can see some primitive tool they use this hand drills to remove uh, vertebrae and uh, disc. It's very interesting. And uh, um, we need to be familiar with the anatomy of the anterior cervical approach. And after cut skin, we should distinguish a platysma. This is a landmark. And the, the sternal colloidal mastoid uh, muscle is in the deep layer. And in this layer, we should distinguish the, uh, some superficial prevertebral muscles, such as the sternal hyoid muscle and the omohyoid muscle. In the deep layer is the the muscle. And we just along this internal side of the stenocleidal mastoid muscle and the lateral side of omohyoid and the cyrohyoid uh, muscle. And uh, we can uh, just uh, dissect the visceral sheath and uh, uh, vascular sheath and uh, get access to the anterior part of the cervix spine. And then we should distinguish the long skull is very important. And we can uh, we also can see the anterior longitudinal ligament and the disc. In coronal plane, um, the landmark is an unsinite process. And when we remove the disc, we could not uh, be on the bilateral unsinite process because the vertebral artery is uh, in lateral side. So when we should remove the alternate process and to get fully decompression, we just uh, uh, simply put a detacher between the vertebral artery and uh, alternate process. And then we can just safely use drills to remove the alternate process. And when we remove the disc, we can see the posterior longitudinal ligament. Uh, also the vagus nerve is, uh, the vagus is, is very important. It, uh, the right side of the vagus nerve it turned down and it turned around the subclavian artery and formed the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which we call the barking and hoarseness of the patient uh, when get injured. So we when when we do operation, we just uh, use the anterior approach. The incision is in uh, around the internal side of the stenocleidal mastoid muscle, and all you we can use transverse incision. Uh, inside the skin, uh, skin crease to instead. Then we use, can expose the three to four segments. And usually we use the right side and uh, which can protect the R RLN, that recurrent laryngeal nerve and the blunt dis dissect along the platysma and the prevertebral muscles. Also dissect with the visceral and the vascular sheath. We should coagulate and ligate all the bleeding vessels and protect the tracheal and esophagus that in visceral sheath and the vascular sheath and the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And also we need to identify both sides of the longest column muscles. We dissect the uh, muscles and form a bag so we can put the retractor blade under the muscle and achieve a better exposure. If we do not form a bag, 
sometimes it's very slippery and it's hard to expose the anterior part of the cervix spine. And we need to confirm uh, if the segment is, is we want and using the lightening needle and uh, uh, confirm it by intraoperative imaging. Next, we can do uh, tumor resection or we do decompression. If we uh, want to decompression, uh, first we should do dissectomy and also resect anterior ossicular fights. And uh, usually uh, when remove the disc, we should drill, use drills to resect the posterior edge and the ossicular fights because uh, posterior osteophytes always uh, compress the dura, compress the spinal cord is very important. So the ways of the decompression do not beyond the bilateral unsummated joint to protect the vertebral artery. And we should remove the post, uh, posterior longitudinal ligament and expose bilateral exposed nerves. Then we can choose the appropriate cages with allograft or autograft or just to use artificial discs for non-fused operation. So um, this is a, a male patient with uh, right arm pain. And we can see the MR show the C5 to 6 spondylosis. And uh, we can see the abnormal signal on T2. So the X-ray show the, the, uh, the loss of the height of intervertebral of C5 to 6. So we did C5 to 6 ACDF. So first we just cut the disc and then use the rug to remove the disc and then put the two screws to expose the uh, intervertebral space. And uh, uh, usually uh, we, we can use a curate or sometimes, uh, um, sometimes the disc is, is, uh, is combined with ossifies, just use drills. Do not exceed the bilateral onsenit process because it is very important to protect the particular artery, but we need to distinguish it to get the fully decompression. And uh, uh, we can use a curison uh, to remove the ligament. Also, we get the compression of intervertebral form is very important. If any bleed, we just can use the surgery form to compress, although it's, it's not difficult sometimes and we should treat the cartilage terminal and uh, choose the appropriate cage for next fusion. Okay. Um, this is a post-operation imaging. We can see the plate and screws um, form a bench or trapezoid, just like, don't be quantilateral, it's unstable. So this is a two-level ACDF uh, with a, a cervix spondylosis and a stenosis. And uh, also we can see abnormal a signal on T2. And uh, after operation, uh, the spinal cord was decompressed well and uh, the screws of the plate looks good. So I like two-level ACDF because the, uh, this ACDF, two-level ACDF has the powerful uh, ability to correct the lordosis, but it will not increase the CSVA, which is related with the quality of life. So uh, though uh, three level ACDF has more strong, powerful um, ability to correct the lordosis, but it will increase the CSVA. So, so cervical sagittal uh, pyramids that we choose, sometimes we, if we can choose two level, do not use three level ACDF. Uh, this is another case for three level uh, three level ACDF. Um, this is a male patient, and with a JO score is nine, and uh, the MR showed the uh, disc protrusion and the cervical stenosis. So, um, so we did a, a C3 to C6 set, uh, three level ACDF. They did compress it good, and the cage looks looks good, and the post uh, uh, operation JO uh, raised to thirteen. So this is another case for four level ACDF. This is a very interesting case. Uh, this is a 19 female and two years ago, uh, she underwent a C5 to 6 intraspinal extramedullary tumor resection with laminal plasty in other hospital. And the pathologist showed the enterogenesis cyst. We found that the patient with enterogenesis cyst is, um, uh, is a high incidence of recurrent and sometimes it would destroy 
um, the cervical spine uh, stability. So uh, unfortunately, after two months after operation, we can see the cyst is still there, but the patient had no symptom. So this year, the patient feels neck pain and getting worse and worse. So our MR showed that cyst just keep the same, but we can see the cervical lordosis is not good, just like kyphosis. And the CT scan showed the cervical kyphosis and the dynamic X-ray showed that the deformity is all the, was not soft. It could not be uh, re restored by uh, deck hypertension. So the cover angle was nearly 50. So we decided to um, use a C, uh, anterior approach to do C3 to 7, 4 level ACD to correct the low uh, correct the deformity. So this is a during operation, we can see the low doses was back after four level ACDF. And this is the cervical uh, uh, sagittal alignment. We can see this uh, CSVA T1 slope and uh, the low doses was better than pro operation. Just like uh, ACDF, ACCF means doing copectomy and using mesh or allograft or autograft to achieve the fusion. So this is another case is a C6 to seven spine tumor because uh, the blood supply is abundant. Uh, we can see that the, uh, the tumor destroyed the anterior and the posterior structure of the cervical spine. Also, the lordosis is not good. Just uh, we, we can see the curve angle is, um, is positive. That means kyphosis. So um, we removed the tumor by ACCF. And uh, uh, we can see after operation, we just put mesh and after operation, the lordosis is, is good. And the curve, uh, the curve angle is negative. And uh, uh, because uh, the tumor destroyed the posterior, structure of the cervix spice, so we combined with the posterior fixation. And then the post-operative pathology showed the hemangial pilocytoma. Um, this is another bitch case on um, weakness of lower limbs for a year, and the physical examination showed the unstable gait and the Babinski sign is positive. And we can, we can see that C5 and the C6 are spondy lowly cysts and uh, with the cervical stenosis. Uh, so the CT, CT showed that this, uh, the cervix spine uh, is un, unstable. And uh, we can see the uh, spondylolysis, the length is above 3.5, and the angle between C5 to C6 is above 11 degree. So it is unstable. Uh, the dynamic X-ray also showed. So uh, we uh, decided to do C6 ACCF and uh, after operation, we can see um, the lordosis is back and the intervertebral height increase. So this is uh, after operation, we can see the lordosis is good and uh, the intervertebral height uh, increased. So uh, the indication for anterior approach, uh, usually including soft disc herniation and the vertebral body osteophytes OPLL, vertebral body fracture, and unstable cervix spine and tumor. And for multi-level ACDF, we should know most popular procedure in multi-level degenerative cervical diseases. But we also should uh, should pay attention to its uh, complications, such as adjacent segment degeneration. We should know the risk of injury of the anterior neurovascular and the visceral structures, such as the tracheal escrow figures and the artery and the recurrent laryngeal nerve injury. And we should know more levels we fused and the lower fusion rates we get. So what to do if disease levels are more than two levels? So uh, when choice is non-fusion surgery, such as use artificial disc. Um, so we can see this, this, this case, but this such a uh, patient um, should, should be, had a high self-control ability and uh, the patient should know how to maintain his cervix spine. That is very important because it is, it is a non-fusion operation. Also, we can use a dynamic cervical implant to get a dynamic balance of the cervical spine. 
Uh, also, we can combine it with fusion and no fusion, that means hybrid surgery. And this is a, another choice. So how to choose um, anterior and the posterior approach? So I think four points need to be conserved. The first is where the compression comes from. Either the compression is mainly from the posterior, uh, such as the ossification of the flame. So we should choose a posterior approach. If it is uh, the compression is mainly from anterior, so anterior approach is appropriate. And uh, cervical lordosis is another point is uh, uh, if the cervical lordosis is not good or kyphosis already, because the anterior approach has a strong, powerful uh, ability to restore the lordosis, so we can choose anterior approach. The third is if the patient is combined with a developmental cervical spinal stenosis, we should use posterior approach. And uh, um, we should consider the numbers of the fused levels. If more than three segments, posterior approach is more appropriate because uh, the more uh, the more we fused and the, the less fusion rate we get. And the K line is another important factor. So we know that K line positive patients usually have a better recovery rate than K line negative patients uh, when use posterior approach. This is another. Uh, important factors. So about those complications, they never had a perfect approach. So overall mobility rates of anterior approach vary from uh, about 30%. And uh, such as the dysphagia and the post-operative recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy and the soda arthrosis or post-operative hematoma. Some, sometimes the hematoma will um, will compress compared to the tracheal and uh, cause the severe severe respiratory dysfunction. So it's very dangerous. So we need to you, we need to leave drainage after operation. This is important. So um, for a surgeon choice, uh, we should consider that has an anatomy of the individual patient, and we should consider relative success of the chosen approach for achieving the goals. We should consider relative risk for complications, and we also should consider patient symptom and the surgeon's experience. So I'd like to thank Prof Professor Xi, Professor Chu, Liu, Li, and for their help and the support. So that's all for today, and thank you for your attention. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Zairong. It was a wonderful yeah. lecture. Uh, Professor Morata, would you like to say something, Professor Morata? Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, Professor Long, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. I very much enjoyed about the surgical procedure. I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon, so I, I don't have so many cases for the anterior approach. Usually, I approach from the posterior, but I do approach transoral for some pediatric patient. Uh, what's the youngest age of the patient you have experience for the transoral approach in your cities? For young patient, we we all uh, we always if uh, if just uh, uh, depends on the disease. If if it is a, it is a cervical such as a cervical tumors, so we also use the posterior or anterior approach. If we can we can easily to remove the tumors. If another, such as an, the degeneration disease is very, um, I, I, I think it is a very lower risk, lower uh, uh, incidence. So um, we have no such experience, but if we meet these patients, we always use, we always use um, anterior approach. So to, 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 to treat these, these patients, thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. How, how do you manage a case of CSF leak post-operative during an ACDF? So I, yeah, so I think it is very low because we are neurosurgeons. When we, sometimes we just do pituitary uh, surgeries, uh, the CSF leakage is very common. So uh, I think, I think uh, when we meet the CSF leakage, but uh, maybe especially for OPAL, um, the incidence is higher. And uh, also for uh, just for cervical spondylosis is very low. And uh, I think uh, if we meet these cases, uh, we just use uh, some, sometimes we just use some um, facial mucus and uh, to stop the leakage. 
and just uh, use some growth. And after operation, we can leave the drainage and uh, to treat these patients. I think this is not a very big problem, but we should pay attention to this leakage when we do operation. Thanks. Thank you very much. There is a question which has popped up by Paul. Asked by Pablo de Andre Cujaro, who is asking, does the patient with honor syndrome after ACDF improve? And how long does it take? I think I think the, this instance is very is very uh, is very low. Um, I I mean the honor thing honor syndrome. I met uh, maybe maybe two or three patients. Not very not not very common. So because I think this is symp sympathetic uh, the nerves. Sometimes it we just uh, slow the. Uh, through the visceral and uh, the vascular sheaths. So sometimes, it, sometimes it's, it is very, uh, very low incidence to meet this, to meet this nerve. So, yeah. Thank you very such much. Such as a dysphagia, yeah, such as a dysphagia. It, it's not, not common. Yeah. Okay. Liu, would you like to ask something? Hello, uh, Prof, thanks for your excellent uh, lecture. Uh, I wanted to find out from you regarding your anterior approach. You have shown a case of uh, uh, long extensive uh, anterior uh, fusion uh, for a kyphotic deformity after a posterior approach. Uh, mm -hmm. May I know that what are the contraindication, uh, I mean, cases that we will not do from anterior in, in cases with a severe kyphotic deformity? And my second question is, uh, in what case of OPLL, that you would choose anterior approach rather than a posterior approach. And my last question is, if all uh, anterior approaches, which, which type of surgery that you will require intraoperative monitoring? Okay. Um, uh, I, I, uh, I answer the second question is for OPLL. Uh, sometimes, you know, in China, sometimes uh, some <coughs> doctors like a posterior approach, they, just to do posterior approach for all the OPR. But I think this for OPR, usually we can just divide the spinal cord for nine parts. If we can, uh, also we can, if, if, in, if in the uh, heart, if we can just uh, divide it into, into nine parts, if in uh, area one, two, six, this, is, uh, this paper is uh, published by Changzhen Hospital. That in, in area one, two, six, uh, that 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 means we can use anterior approach. If if not, we can we should use the posterior approach. And also sometimes we should uh, we should distinguish the K line. If the K line is positive, the anterior uh, the anterior approach uh, approach is bad. Um, and for uh, sorry sorry, the first question is uh, Liu. What was your first question, Liu? Hello. Liu, Hello, your Prof. First yeah. question was. Yeah, my first question was on the uh, kyphotic oh, deformity uh, to to come anteriorly. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so um, deformity we it depends on sometimes it depends on the cover angle. Uh, it's uh, such such as is if the the cover angle is not is not is not too big, and also sometimes uh, we uh, the uh, the deformity is soft. We can just use a posterior approach, but if it is a very solid, and also sometimes it's um we need we need to correct the deformity, which is uh the the copper angle is very very big, so we should use anterior approach because it has a strong ability to correct the lordosis. Thanks. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think we have exceeded our time for today. Uh, I'll formally close this uh, webinar for today. Professor Morota, any final closing comments you would like to make? Oh, no. <laughs> Thank you very much for everybody for the tonight. Yeah, um, this is a very good experience for me too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor Diroko, any final comments? Yeah. No, it was very interesting and I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the moderator to you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. So I'll close this webinar formally. Uh, on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of Yuko Kato, I hereby express my sincere gratitude to the speakers, Professor Francisco Di Rocco and Professor Zairang, for giving us such a wonderful lecture 
in their subspecialties. Uh, thank you, Professor Naguhito Morota, for coming here and chairing this session. So until next uh, Saturday, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.